Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. And in the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of living nature, of which we're an integral part, and with deep gratitude to all the generations before us that have brought us to the present moment, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we embark on day eight of a 10 day program contemplating the utility and inspirational value of nonviolence in our shattered world. As we have been traversing the days, we've been tracking events in Iran. You'll all remember that when we commemorated the funeral of Queen Elizabeth on the 19th of October, uh, it was also the funeral of Masa Amini, uh, the young 22-year-old Iranian a woman who was visiting her family, walking down the streets of Tehran and was uh, beaten to death by the morality police uh, because she didn't have her hijab on correctly. So that event was like a George Floyd moment and it reverberated around the world and there's been a rising crescendo of outrage and protest uh, both outside uh, Iran and in uh, dozens and dozens of countries, uh, but also inside Iran. Uh, we were fortunate that uh, Banafshe Sayyad, uh, who was born in Iran, whose family has endured uh, exile from uh, Iran and has been active in the Iranian community for the last uh, four decades, uh, was um, with us and has been focalizing energy as we day by day discuss violence and nonviolence and how we can effectively uh, generate real social change uh, in the world. Uh, so I would like to uh, invite Panafshe uh, on, uh, who will give us an update, lead us in our uh, usual uh, coherence breathing, uh, centering, and then tee up our program. So Banafshe, thank you so much for everything that you're doing as we, you've been uh, generating interest and attention on what's going on in your country of origin. Thank you so much, Jim, and hello to everyone. Um, thank you for your attention to, to Iran. Uh, because the government um, of Iran is severely um, restricting internet access, the news is very sporadic. Um, so we get it through social media and talking to friends and family. Uh, as well as some news outlets um, that have reported that high school girls have now also become the latest Iranians to join the anti-government protests um, in large, large numbers, uh, taking off their hijab, their um, Islamic um, head covering, you know, in their schools and taking photos uh, of, of their group in um, as they protest, and they, they actually have said that this is not a protest any longer, this is a revolution that is starting. As um, the country has been mourning uh, a 17-year-old um, victim, uh, Nika Shakarami, who was also killed um, in the first days of um, the uprising, by, by, led by the women. Uh, there's a real unity uh, among the Iranians, both in Iran and outside of Iran. And this is something that we have uh, not seen in a long, long, long time. So people are mobilizing and uniting around this cause, um, this outrage um, because of the murder of Masa Amini. Uh, but many, many people have ex assessed that this uprising is doomed to fail and it's doomed to be crushed under the boots of the uh, revolutionary guards. That after all is the history of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The baton, the censorship and the police um, brutality and, and just the brutality of the government in quelling um, any, any protest, any uprising violently. Um, the, uh, so if the past is a tutor, we hear, it is easy to write the obituary of this round of protests, people say. Um, the women's wing in Evin prison is a living monument to the repression of women's rights. Um, the hijab has 
become uh, a central symbol of um, revolutionary morals for, for the regime. Um, Khomeini, who was um, the first supreme leader, once said, if the Islamic revolution is to have no other result than the veiling of women, then that is enough for the revolution per se. So this is what we're living, um, living through these days, but it is so, so important for us not to lose hope. We actually cannot afford to lose hope. We need to keep, keep the energy high. We need to keep uh, the, the vision that this, uh, this uprising uh, in a nonviolent way will change the regime. Um, when I speak to uh, the women warriors, uh, the young women in Iran, and I speak of hope, um, I was told that they actually don't have hope. They've actually gone beyond that. And I was very moved because uh, they were saying that for them, it's, uh, they don't see the result yet because this government has been so violently quelling any kind of dissent that they've given up hope. What they're doing is just taking the right action, you know, s moment by moment. What does, the, what is the ethical action? What is the ethical dictate? What is the, what is the human call to this situation? And they're taking actions based on that and so bravely doing what they're doing as many of you are hearing in the news. Uh, so what I want to invite our group in this very short time that I have is um, as we focus on the coherent breathing that is, has been the tradition of um, humanity rising now for um, some time with Jim leading everybody into the coherent breathing, um, what I call love breath. And I would like us to focus on Iran and why do I call um, this love breath? Why do I call the coherent breathing love breath? It is because it is, um, we're taking five, 5.5 5 um, breaths per minute. We're focusing on inhaling for five and a half seconds and exhaling for five and a half seconds through our nose. And five is the number associated with uh, the planet Venus and the goddess Aphrodite the five-pointed star. We connect the coherent breathing to Venus and seek, seek to fill ourselves. And I want to share just uh, this image. We seek to fill ourselves with um, her, her inspiration and her presence, the one who is the goddess of love, of beauty and eros, with her hair flowing and the celebration of the naked body, the feminine body, as these are our weapons um, as we stand up um, against um, this government, this regime, this group of um, thugs that want to keep Iran um, in the, uh, you know, they, they want to eradicate and have been eradicating the Persian culture and want to revert um, to an eighth century way of um, conduct and way of living in the 21st century. Um, so I invite us as a group, as we go into our coherent breathing, to ground ourselves in peace and then focus on sending light, sending love to these brave, brave women and men of Iran. So um, as you sit comfortably, please, Sense the ground with your feet, both feet, and let yourself elongate through your torso and lengthen as you remain relaxed and at ease. I'm going to ask Georg to play the video and the audio for us that we will um, that will lead us into breathing for five and a half seconds, inhaling and exhaling for five and a half seconds as we also look at this beautiful um, pattern that Earth and Venus create as they um, circle the sun. Can you please play the audio?
Please continue breathing and come in touch with your heart. Breathing in and out of your heart space. And feel how as you breathe in the precious life force, you ignite and expand the light in your heart. And with your exhalation, you spread this light out into the environment. Now please connect your heart with the hearts of those on this call from different parts of the world. And feel how as you merge the light of your heart with the rest of us into one heart, you feel an expansiveness in your own heart and body. Can we together beam this light into Iran? Feel yourself beaming this light into the hearts of the brave women and men, the girls, the boys who are standing up for their right to live as free human beings. Feel this light empowering them, energizing them, and let them feel our support and our allegiance as we hold their safe passage through this turbulence. Seeing freedom, justice, and peace once again permeating the ancient land of Persia in the name of love. And so it is. Amen. And when you're ready, please open your eyes if they're not open already and behold this beautiful graphic of Mahsa Amini, the messenger of Ma, the great mother, in front of the map of Iran, holding the hijab or the Islamic headdress as defiance and an emblem of peace to come. Mahsa has catalyzed a global liberation movement that is starting in Iran and will be encompassing the world. Thank you. Can you stop sharing the screen? Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Uh, I'm going to turn over the, the mic to Tom and ask um, Tom to introduce uh, your panelists, please. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I would like to ask your, you and your panelists the question that I asked on Monday and ask, find, find um, you know, your, your messages, your opinion on um, if you are in Iran right now, looking down the barrel of a gun, how, how do you put your nonviolent perspectives into action? You know, the majority of women who are leading the uprising want a nonviolent regime change, but they're facing a ruthless, ruthless dictatorship, as you know, that has proved that it does not value human life, at least not the life of their citizens. So what is your message to them? Yeah, thank you, Banafshe. It's uh, just been fantastic that you were able to join us last Friday and again this week and, uh, and being able to provide us with updates and connection to what's happening in, in Iran. Um, your question is so important. And I was delighted that you know, we had uh, Stephen Zunis with us earlier this week to share how the women in Sudan responded when, uh, when there was the uprising in in Sudan, and I'm confident that the panelists we have today will be able to provide other real examples of what the women and girls in, in Iran can do um, that's effective, that's work, that can work. And uh, most importantly, I wanna make sure that the, the women and the men in Iran continue to have hope. And I, I do understand and I do appreciate your, your comment that it's beyond hope right now. 
uh, for many of them, uh, and their convictions are, are beyond just hoping. But I, I do want them to know that they're not alone and that um, the, the world is watching and is, is in support. Um, what we'd like to do is just quickly uh, show a quick uh, trailer of the third harmony that my uh, my dear friend and, uh, and colleague, uh, Michael Nagler, um, was a writer and, and uh, director of. Michael's uh, professor of classics and comparative study, uh, comparative literature emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, teaches in a peace and conflict studies program he founded on the campus in the 1970s. In addition to teaching at Berkeley, he speaks frequently for media and the general public on issues of peace and nonviolence, and does presentations around the world for the Blue Mountain Center of Meditation. Michael's written six books and contributes articles frequently to Tacoon, Yes Magazine, and many other progressive journals. He's consulted for the US Institute of Peace and many organizations and projects dealing with nonviolence and world peace. Michael is the founder, president of the Meta Center. Welcome, Michael. And Georg, if you can uh, tee up the, the uh, film trailer. It seems like every one of us has this big library of humanity and nonviolence inside him. One thing we have in common as individuals, as human beings, is the power to show love. The basis of nonviolence is love. Governments have spent billions and billions of dollars getting violent science right in the past 400 years. And I think that it's time that we invest some time and energy into alternatives. Our evolutionary mandate is to move into the peaceful cooperation because we see now that we're destroying our own infrastructure, we're destroying the planet we depend on. If you start from the assumption that everybody has a good core in their nature, that we're all deeply interconnected, that there is no problem which cannot be resolved to the benefit of all parties, if you start with those assumptions, and even if you don't believe them, you take them on as a hypothesis, as assumptions, and you test them, and you find out that it works. We have to think big. Sojourner Truth didn't think small. Martin Luther King didn't. Gandhi didn't. They had big, bold ideas. Seeing it firsthand, seeing the power of nonviolence, and feeling we really have the, the power to make history, to change history. So I'd like to introduce our uh, extraordinary uh, group of panelists uh, today. We have um, we have a a, <laughs> a wealth of uh, of panelists who have done some extraordinary work in the uh, in the nonviolence arena, and uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have each of you uh, each of you joining us today. So let me start with. Um, Introducing each of our uh, each of our, our uh, panelists, Rivera Sun is an author activist. Uh, she's written numerous books and novels, including the Dandelion Insurrection and the award winning Ari Ara series. She's the editor of Nonviolence News and the program coordinator for Campaign Nonviolence. Her articles are syndicated by Peace Voice and published in hundreds of journals nationwide. Rivera Sun. Uh, serves on the advisory board of World Beyond War and the board of Backbone Campaign. Michael Beer has been director of Nonviolence International since 1998. 
Michael is a global activist for human rights, minority rights, and argues against war and casino capitalism. He's trained activists in many countries, including Myanmar, Kosovo, Tibet, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Zimbabwe, and the US. He's a frequent public speaker on nonviolence and has been broadcast on C-SPAN, CNN, and other major media outlets. Michael is a co-parent of two children with his life partner, Latanya. Ivan Morovich uh, is an organizer and educator and social innovator who currently works at the International Center on Non-Conflict, uh, Nonviolence Conflict. He was a student organizer and one of the leaders of Otpor, a resistance movement which played an important role in the downfall of Slobodan Milosevic in 2000. Ivan holds a BSc in, in Process Engineering from Belgrade University and a Master's in International Relations from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He currently lives in Washington, DC. Mary Hanna hails from Detroit, Michigan, though she's made her home in Langsburg for many years now. She re received her master's degree in behavioral disorder from Vanderbilt University and worked as a counselor case manager for community health, mental health for 20 years before becoming the operations manager for the Meta Peace Team in 2005, where she coordinates both Meta Peace Team violence de-escalation skills training program and her internship program. She has served on both international, uh, international and domestic peace teams throughout the US in Palestine, Israel, and the US-Mexico border. Additionally, she became the Pax Christi Michigan State Coordinator in 2015. It was named a Pax Christi USA Ambassador of Peace in, two, 2000, uh, in 2022. She currently uh, is working on a handbook for domestic peace teams. Mary's committed to compassionate, assertive nonviolence, social justice, creative peacemaking, and the spiritual underpinnings that make it all possible. And finally, uh, Rosie Davila is the art and media coordinator for Pache Bene uh, Campaign Nonviolence. She's an artist and a poet and a senior at the University of Kentucky. She lives on a flower farm in central Kentucky with her twin sister and her parents. Welcome everyone. Rivera, why don't we start with you? And uh, if you could just give us a quick uh, overview of where nonviolence is uh, happening in the world and uh, some of the results that we're seeing. Uh, amazing campaigns that you're very attuned to. Great, thank you so much, Tom. And thanks for organizing with so many other people this wonderful summit on nonviolence. It is, as Gandhi said, the greatest and most active force on earth. And one of our big challenges today is to, in today's world, is to actually see it for what it is, see how big, immense, powerful, and transformative uh, nonviolence is in our world. I run something called Nonviolence News. It's one of the many ways I show up for this uh, growing nonviolence movement. Uh, we collect 30 to 50 stories of nonviolence in action each and every single week. Uh, from around the world. We share these stories, especially success stories, recent actions, things that are happening for different types of issues like economic justice, racial justice, the earth, housing justice, the list goes on. We pick up creative stories. We share uh, reports that are coming out about how to do this better how to um, learn from mistakes or errors we've all made around, along the way, even how-to guides. So in this role, I get to see thousands of nonviolence uh, campaigns each and every single year. It's incredible what's going on. And I thought today I would just uplift some of the success stories from the past year, some of the recent actions and some uh, takeaways, things we can learn from it to get the ball rolling for today's great conversation. Uh, most recently, Sri Lanka actually ousted their president over an economic crisis, and they are now in the midst of following up that success with actually getting a leader in power that they feel is going to make an actual difference in that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. 
Another story I'd like to uplift that happened just recently in the past uh, two months is the people in Panama actually won a 30% price reduction on all essential goods, which is pretty incredible. They're part of a rising trend of cost of living protests going on. South Korean truckers uh, in this summer ground the uh, inter- almost ground the entire international shipping trade to a halt with a very well coordinated eight day strike that won minimum wage guarantees and fuel subsidies. And I also like to not just share the very big mass movements that happen, but the small ones that are targeted in specific, like the flower pickers strike in Washington State, state where they organized a, what they call a quickie strike right three days before the this big tulip festival. Uh, and indeed they won their goals, which were modest in the relative scheme of things, but incredibly important for their uh, workplace safety and their health and well-being. We also like to share stories and reports that are coming from the kind of the the long arc of change. Things like looking at how the Pacific Northwest defeated 70% of all the major fossil fuel projects that came across its plate in the past several decades. This is pretty remarkable when you think about it. The majority of these campaigns involve some type of nonviolent action. And these major fossil fuel projects were big projects. Um, one of the things we lose sight of oftentimes is the long arc of what we're doing. So we tend to track our our failures or our setbacks very well and feel those very deeply, but we lose sight of what happens when a region gains skills year after year, struggle after struggle, campaign after campaign, and actually holds a line in the sand on an important issue like uh, fossil fuels. So here's a few other notable stories that I'm going to uplift today uh, that come from Nonviolence News in the past three months. Colombia has had a number of stories, but one of the ones that caught my eye and attention were their nonviolent youth patrols. They're doing direct counter recruitment and keeping children especially out of the pathway into the the multi-pronged armed conflict that has been going on for decades. And they're actively organizing a different kind of, let's say, peace army or nonviolent army and training young people in not joining militaries and gaining nonviolent skills and protecting their communities with peace building and nonviolent tools that I'm sure Mary will talk about later. We see these at home uh, domestically here in the US. A great example happened in Minneapolis where Uh, These young men replaced the use of cops in the schools. We also like to uplift specific campaigns that are very targeted and and local, but doing great strategic work, uh, like this campaign in South Dakota to call out a, um, a racist hotel owner. Also, some of the campaigns that happen are so big and bold that they make us rethink the whole way that we see the world. And the Zapatistas definitely have a long history of this, not all of which is nonviolent, but this particular campaign where they reinvaded Spain uh, in a um, act of creative, imaginative, nonviolent action was certainly one of them. So in nonviolence news, we also see trends, patterns that are emerging in these many, many, many nonviolent struggles that are happening. Things like protests of survival, cost of living protests are on the rise around the world. Uh, We see that labor uprisings are taking off, uh, particularly not just in unionization campaigns, which are rising, but also in um, outside of the, the established unions. So starting new unions like the Mexican General Motors workers. Um, or wildcat strikes or labor organizing outside of a union framework. We also see that uh, as the housing crisis rises, so does resistance to it. And uh, 
particularly across Latin and South America, women's uprisings, uh, even prior to Iran's incredible uprising that's going on right now, uh, we're mobilizing more and more deeply year after year and learning from and with one another to stop uh, femicide, rape, uh, violence against women, to ensure reproductive justice, and a number of other goals. We can also see trends of like who is emerging as leaders and certainly the youth under the age of 18 need to be specifically mentioned in this because of the climate justice struggle in the US, the anti-gun violence and school shootings um, and a number of other issues. We're seeing, you know, college students 18 to 24 were typical uh, nonviolent struggle agents. We, we see them a lot in movements. But under 18, this is a growing force for change in our world, and they are powerful. So we can learn from one another's struggles. And in Nonviolence News, we try to do that learning, um, so not to judge or critique what didn't work, um, but to learn for our own struggles. You know, we try to look at when things fail, when they don't work out, when they get grueling, what can we learn from the, the struggles and the suffering and the challenges faced by people in other parts of the world or in other parts of our own country? We're trying to become more nuanced about how we count wins, right? And not being too quick about saying, oh, that movement failed because they've entered a new chapter. Sudan is a great example. They were successful in ousting their 30 year dictatorship. They are in a new chapter of struggle to ensure a full democratic transition to a civilian led government. So being nuanced about that. We're always trying to uplift and break through the idea that the only people who have power to make a change or a difference are politicians or that laws are the only way to make change and to notice how other sectors of civil society and economics and business and social uh, norms and culture can also make change. And we are also seeing a trend of uh, people around the world are having to shift from more abstract issues to the front burner issues, the things that are directly impacting their lives today, tomorrow, the next day. And a common theme that we can look for together is how are movements countering or breaking through that kind of hopelessness or sense of futility or despair that so many of us uh, feel. And I think Iran is giving us an important message about that of like, sometimes you have to go beyond hope and do something because it is the right thing to do. So I'm gonna leave you with some creative tactics, things that have emerged that are quite brilliant. Uh, I think this will end on a very positive note and also reveal the immense kind of creativity and unexpectedness of nonviolence and how it is used to make change. We find stories that we wouldn't even necessarily think of as nonviolent action, but indeed, when you think deeply about them, they are. Like Finland painting reindeer's antlers with reflective paint to stop car collisions with reindeers. This is nonviolence both to human motorists and to the reindeer. <laughs> uh, storytelling uh, in, for migrant justice in detention centers and migrant community. Uh, this climate activist gate crashed, like she hid in the bathroom and then burst onto the runway of this fashion show at the Louvre to uh, call out the fa fashion industry's um, destruction of the planet. Uh, Afghan women uh, used a whole social media campaign to push back against the Taliban's attempt to establish that the the full length burqa was the only kind of traditional clothing in Afghanistan. Indeed, they posted these photos to say, no, that's not true. And we won't let you have that um, kind of um, moral authority on what is Afghan culture. Other notable um, kind of digital actions include World of Warcraft workers holding a virtual sit-in against sexual harassment or people, Reddit users, um, crashing a, a website where Kellogg's was trying to hire temporary workers to replace their striking workers. So Reddit users put in fake applications and so many of them that they over, overloaded the system and crashed the site so it could no longer work to hire what they call scabs. 
We also see things like um, direct action. So in Italy, in this particular marine bay, there was a problem with uh, fishermen trawling the bottom of the ocean and destroying the ecosystem. So the sculptor made statues that rebuild the marine ecosystem, but also the nets get tangled on them. So the fishermen who do that kind of fishing no longer fish in this area, and the whole ecosystem has been protected. There's also direct um, civil disobedience, like this man in Montreal who plants uh, gardens in the place of lawns. And disguised actions, like in Myanmar during the uh, earlier stages of their anti-coup campaign, the regime has banned all protests and demonstrations and blockades of roads. So they started doing things like dropping onions in the streets and slowly picking them up to bring traffic in the city to a grinding halt. And everyone knew this was a protest against the military regime, but when the police arrived on the scene, they were like, what are you doing? And the people said, oh, we just dropped some onions. So disguised actions also count uh, for nonviolent action and can be incredibly helpful, particularly in very repressive situations. Uh, the one story I love is that the Yaqui women in Mexico, um, well, their community had actually won through nonviolent struggle, the, uh, the halting of a pipeline but the government and the had, and the company had never actually removed the pipeline from their land. So the Yaki women organized their community to actually dig up the pipeline, cut it into pieces, and then they sold it as scrap metal and kept the proceeds. Property destruction is often a very gray area for nonviolent struggle and how you do it is as significant as the action itself. So teasing out some of those nuances is important for our struggles. And I'll just close on Bolivia because Bolivia has had some of the most remarkable back and forth dueling campaigns between their right and left over major political issues. Um, and the majority of the actions that have gone on are nonviolent. And uh, this particular one, uh, the right-wing government workers in opposition to the left-wing government organized a strike. And so the left mobilized a mass day of demonstration in support of the left-wing government, uh, which overwhelmed the impact of the uh, right-wing strike against the government. I think this is a glimpse of where our world could be going in terms of the use of nonviolent struggle to resolve our complex issues that we face. If you want more no news, I recommend that you sign up for our free newsletter. It's always pretty uplifting. It's very insightful, and you can find it at nonviolencenews.org. And I'll stop there and turn it over to my other wonderful colleagues. Thank you, Rivera. Love the, uh, the quick global overview of uh, where nonviolence is happening in the world, and hopefully particularly the the people in uh, in the areas of conflict around the globe, whether it's the Ukraine or in Iran, have uh, an opportunity to to get some ideas. I'd next like to invite uh, Mary into our uh, into our conversation and have her um, just share and expand on what Rivera has uh, has shared with us this morning. Uh, well, hello, everybody, and Tom, thank you, and um, I just have to say I'm so excited to be in this company of people, both the ones that I know are here and um, all the people out there that I, I can't see um, or hear at this point, but um, uh, I don't know if Michael Negler has had an opportunity to share his, his map of um, all the different, in my mind, I think of it as this big pie of peace and justice um, it, and a, the world that we all want, and um, and that uh, all the, the the all the people that are talking today have this little slice of a different slice of that pie, um, but we all make it that that beautiful world happen. So it's really just an honor for me um, to be to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Mary Hannah, and I. Uh, do the bulk of my life work for uh, MetaPeace team. And I'm gonna show just a really short uh, video clip that explains what we do and then go from there. 
So I will share screen. My name is Peter Doherty. I'm uh, one of the founding members of MetaPeace Team. I see it as a movement with the idea, how can we make a difference in the world as a group of people committed to an effective nonviolence that really does change the world? One of the things I really love about MPT is it's the type of organization that anyone can get involved in. Anyone can be a nonviolent resistor. Anyone can interrupt violence, whether they're part of a peace team or whether they're doing it in their community or their classroom, because you're using the skills that you have inside you. A peace team is a group of trained volunteers, and our job is to be, first of all, a peaceful presence, that we model the behavior we expect everybody else there to participate in, which is nonviolence, pleasant. We always smile at people. We don't take sides in a conflict. That's not our responsibility. We protect people from violence no matter who the instigator is, who the source is. A lot of what you do is basically be alert, watch, get to an area as quickly as you can to de-escalate something before it gets out of hand. Talk to people, listen to people. So we're there to, to help keep everyone safe the best we're able, using whatever leverage we have out of our organizational skills or the yellow vest having sense of power or authority that we wear. And then uh, at the end of the day, our job is to sit down and debrief how it went. To me, it kind of feels like we've discovered an inoculation for violence. It might not work in every situation, but it definitely works. We've got the tangible proof that it works. And so what we need is a way, first of all, to get people to know that this inoculation, this potential cure, exists. And then we've got to figure out a way of how to dis distribute it, um, get it into the communities that need it, get people access to it. What we need is people trained in nonviolent de-escalation skills, nonviolent intervention skills. Training is like uh, an experience into a different kind of world whereby you are taking a risk, you aren't sure what's going to happen, and we try to take people out of their comfort zone because the best learning is when you're in a bit of discomfort whereby you're more alert and more receptive to learn things that are new. You're going to get a little bit of listening and communication skills. You're going to get a little bit of some concrete tools for being a third party that's intervening in a conflict where there's the potential for violence. You're going to do a lot of looking inside of yourself all sort of grounded in the spirituality of nonviolence that MPT brings to everything we do. And then you may choose to go deeper into any one of those, and MPT has avenues to help you do that, or we can connect you with lots of other organizations and people and resources if you want to go deeper. In its own way, it's, it's intoxicating because you see it work. You see that People's lives are saved and lives are changed and to know that you had a part in that, that your life is making a difference, that's, um, it's compelling and it's exciting. So you get an idea, I think, of the kind of work that we do. And our biggest um, efforts are, first of all, convincing ordinary citizens that they have the power to make a change um, in their world and in their communities and in their governments. And um, if you think about it, to be violent doesn't take a whole heck of a lot of thought. 
you're either hitting somebody with your words or physically. Um, but nonviolence is all about being creative. It's all about thinking outside the box. It's all about um, talking to each other and partnering with each other and collaborating with each other and, um, and learning what works and what doesn't work and, and how to do it different the next time. Um, there's a, a phrase from Maslow that if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And our job is to give people as many additional tools as they can so that when one attempt at nonviolence doesn't work, then they can reach into their toolbox and grab another. And if that doesn't work, they can reach into their toolbox and grab another. Um, we can do this at every level. Uh, we do it with children. We do it with high school students, college students. We have, um, we've taught these skills um, to homeschooled kids over summer break. Like um, they would come once a week for lessons. And we've done it at Michigan State University, Portland State University. We've got a high school in Detroit that has um, gone through violence de-escalation and bystander intervention skills training every year um, as freshmen for like six years now, which means like every student in the school by the time they graduate has, has been trained in how to de-escalate violent situations. Um, we have placed neighborhood peace teams. So um, groups in the community who want to do something besides call the police, which is becoming more and more militarized. Um, we've done it, uh, we've placed these teams of volunteers at events like the Arab American Festival and Pride Festivals and um, uh, uh, My Body, My Choice events. And then at protests that can be really heated. So um, for example, gun reform often, uh, especially here in the United States and Michigan where I'm at is an open carry state, which means that people can show up at these events and legally have a gun in their hand, on their hip, um, over their shoulder if it's a rifle. Um, and, and to see people like you and me, I, when I first got involved in the peace and justice movement, um, I really thought you had to know like some kind of magic words. There were magic words, I thought that would help calm a situation, that would help somebody connect to their humanity. And, um, and the more I learn, the more I know about what it takes and, and the process that it takes. And that sometimes what you do is you just buy somebody time. You buy them the time to calm down so they can find that inner spark of humanity that we, believe is in everyone. Um, we've done unarmed bodyguards for the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, we have done um, really big political rallies. We've done the um, Republican National Convention in Minnesota, and then the next one, which was in Ohio. Um, and we're pulling in more information about um, what the effects of trauma are. Um, and what that looks like in somebody. So many times I think people have divided the world into two great forces of love and hate, but we try and look at it as love and fear. And so when you see somebody who looks like they're acting really hatefully with a lot of violence, um, we try and imagine, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid that they might have to change their mind about something they've believed in their whole life? Are they afraid that, that, um, that they may have to surrender something, um, whether that's a lifestyle or something tangible? Um, are they afraid that, um, that they're wrong and they don't want to be wrong or that they'll be left alone and, and without you know, their current support system if they, they shift? Um, and so when you look at somebody with the eyes of, you know, compassion and that what they're doing is springing from fear, 
then it's much easier to, to be calm and to pull on your resources to just be present to them. Most people really, really just want to be listened to and more than with just your ears. So I'll leave you with one thing that um, sort of sum, sum, summarizes um, all of um, the work that we're doing. And I have, you know, additional pictures of all the, the peace team stuff we do, but I don't want to um, overshoot my time. Um, but Barbara Deming has a really beautiful way of um, making visible uh, what we are trying to do. And I think in our own way, each of us in this panel is trying to do this. And the first is you hold up a hand and say, stop. I won't participate in your violence. I won't participate in your hate. I won't be pulled into that. And I won't be a part of it. And I need to help you stop. But with the other hand, I'm reaching out. And I'm saying, but I don't reject you as human being. I have compassion for you as a person. And I want to be in relationship with you. And to put those two hands out, um, welcoming somebody and yet not the behavior that's hurtful. Um, it's what we're aiming for in a big picture and, and trying to do that with skills training. So um, I will now pass it to the next person and, uh, and say thank you again for uh, having me be part of this. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. Really appreciate uh, what you shared and all that you and your organization are doing in the world. Ivan, uh, please join us and share. Thank you, Tom. And it's 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 great to be with you today. And I have to say, uh, I was really inspired by uh, a conversation so far, and especially like the 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 examples that uh, Rivera San shared with us. And there, some of them are are really eye opening for me. Uh, so my name is uh, Ivan and uh, Marovich, and I am uh, with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, uh, which has been, uh, how shall I say, in in the field of of civil resistance and nonviolent action for more than two decades. I myself uh, was a student organizer and an activist. Uh, like in the previous century and uh, one of the leaders of hot as, as 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 tom mentioned so my introduction to nonviolent action was uh, of somebody who how should i say was uh, how should i say nonviolence curious uh, but wasn't really ethically uh, or uh, in any kind of how should i say sense uh, determined or or should I say predetermined that 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 nonviolence is the is the right choice. So from that perspective of somebody who is uh, just kind of interested in in uh, kind of any kind of uh, uh, political action and and trying to see which one would work, I was convinced in nonviolent action from uh, as I said from my very first uh, exposure because of the ability of ordinary people to do it. And since I was like a student and, uh, and didn't have uh, much of, of uh, how should I say, skills or knowledge of, how should I say, understanding of the violent uh, action or any kind of armed, uh, armed strategies, uh, for me, it was kind of an obvious uh, choice. That was the only thing that I could do. And what is interesting here is that, you know, the case for for nonviolence only was building stronger as I was ap applying it. So it, it was something like that's the only thing that I can do for now. Uh, going to the uh, position where I actually thought that was the best thing to do and the right thing to do. And so my work with the nonviolent with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict actually, which is a, a, a climax maybe of the 20 years that I've done uh, training, consulting, and uh, working with dissident groups uh, around the world who are facing different 
challenges and they can be uh, social problems, political uh, or even like economic and, and others, but they all play down uh, as a, a conflict in the society over uh, kind of particular issues that they're facing. And their choice to wage that conflict nonviolently comes back again as in some cases, as I said, the only thing that they could do, and in some other cases, the right thing that 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 they chose, the right strategic choice. So, I've in those in those decades, I've actually noticed this uh, method of nonviolent action being uh, uh, applied in very different countries, and I'll just kind of name name a few where I had like personal uh, encounter and I collaboration. With, uh, with activists from those countries. So for instance, uh, a recent one, and Riera actually mentioned it, is Sudan. So Sudan was a country ravaged by conflict when I met uh, uh, first uh, activists who were in like 2013, 2014, following the floods, devastating floods, uh, they were actually organizing and supplying uh, citizens with uh, kind of help and aid because the government of Sudan was incapable of delivering that aid and delivering help for, for the people. And based on those, uh, how should I say, community programs that they, that they kind of set up, which were ad hoc community programs, they started politicizing the issue of the, the inability of, of the regime to take care of, of of its population, but they were facing a very uh, violent environment in which they were operating. And that was ravaged by political violence, the result of the like 30 years of brutal dictatorship and the civil war and, and genocide and, and, and everything that was happening in the country actually left the mark on any type of, uh, any type of organizing. When they were starting, uh, and we were talking for many occasions, like that was that seemed like almost like a an impossible thing. It looked like that that you know the Sudanese uh, would never believe that nonviolent action can actually attract enough enough people, just because it looked like it's it's impossible and that like the political violence is infesting the whole country. But fast forward uh, several years down the road and through uh, this. Uh, how shall I say, uh, concerted effort of, of these activists of uh, different organizations, professional associations and trade unions and students and others, they actually managed to uh, pull off a nonviolent uh, uprising in 2018 and 2019 and actually bring the uh, regime of uh, Bashir to, to an end and bring him down. Which doesn't mean that that the that that everything was nonviolent throughout that uprising. The regime was applying violence all the time against them, but they actually understood and persisted in in that nonviolent strategy that uh, that uh, actually uh, brought about change in the end. And as Riera said, this continues. This is not over, and usually it is not. And uh, and so. Usually the, the struggle continues even when we achieve a particular objective. So I would like now use that example, but also compare it, for instance, to my first example, the, the one that I was, uh, that actually brought me to this, uh, to kind of draw several uh, conclusions or maybe several, <laughs> maybe even oversimplifications, but bear with me. So both in, in Serbia, and in Sudan and, and in many other countries where, where I experienced and, and co communicated with, with, with activists and dissidents, usually uh, situation starts with expression of uh, kind of refusal to, to, to accept the, the status quo. And that is usually in the form of protest in the form of voicing your grievances, uh, kind of shedding light on injustice that is, that is happening and usually filling, filling the streets with the uh, people who are 
uh, feeling aggrieved and they want to kind of put an end to this. So the initial uh, protest in the case of Serbia, let's say when I was involved, was the election fraud in the local elections. This was like something that usually people don't care much, but it was uh, such an injustice for us because we felt that our, our votes were, uh, how shall I say, uh, that our votes were stolen from us that we filled the streets. In the case of Sudan, as I mentioned, it was the floods and the uh, and, uh, inability of the government to, to kind of take care of the population following these floods. After that initial mobilization, and you know, we have uh, a theoretical framework that, that kind of follow that, for instance, Bill Moyer's movement action plan shows that like after the initial mobilization, usually, you know, like protest hits the wall and then there's need to re-strategize. So in our case, it was the, after four months of initial protest, uh, we needed to kind of sit back, go back to the drawing board and think about like, how do we actually grow outside of the initial mobilization because the regime doesn't respond to that uh, initial pressure. And the same thing happened in, in Sudan. So the next step is actually turning the protest into a movement. And that means a long-term effort uh, to, kind of achieve the goals that, that are set out by the, by the protesters. Then the, the third step through, and, and yes, another thing, like the, what movement usually achieves is that instead of just protesting and demonstrating in the streets, these activists and organizers start using other tactics. And, and I think Rivera, showed in the in in some of the uh, examples that she shared with us that what kind of uh, different tactics are there beyond protest and what it comes down to is that movements when they move away from protest or go beyond protest they start using other tactics which are more tactics of non-cooperation like strikes and boycotts and civil civil disobedience and by doing that they actually are preventing the government from uh, or the regime from ruling the country as they wish. And then finally, the third, the third uh, step, which, which happens towards the end, this is where, for instance, Sudan is at the moment, is actually building on that non-cooperation, building on that uh, movement and creating parallel institutions, like institutions of actually parallel civil society, which are the ones uh, that kind of are the glue of the new society that is being born in uh, in this struggle. So, what the reason why I was like so inspired by the by the beginning of this uh, call is because of the centrality of love. And when we talk about uh, love, meaning that uh, what are the feelings, not just to people that we are that are part of our immediate surrounding. Uh, and you know, like our friends, our relatives, our members of our family, but actually what are the feelings that, that we have towards people that we don't even know? And that actually is through the process of building of these parallel institutions, uh, that fabric that keeps the, the, the society uh, together, that fabric that keeps us all as, 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 as human beings uh, together is actually being born and it's being strengthened. So what starts as a quest for justice ends up being the uh, kind of uh, reaches in climax, in cl its climax in, in, in that, uh, how shall I say, finding of love. And in that, in that sense uh, uh, of caring for people that we don't even know. Uh, so just to kind of uh, wrap up this uh, kind of three-step three-step process in like a protest movement and then uh, building of parallel institutions. This is a, a momentous task. And, and as we saw from, 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 the, uh, from, from these examples, and for instance, in the case of Sudan, it, 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 it took years. In the case of Serbia, it took years. In many uh, ca cases, it takes decades to go from, from the initial mobilization all the way to the creation of, of of that new society. So the question now is, what is the practice that is going to take us there? And that practice is 
the practice of nonviolent action and civil resistance. Because this is something that ordinary people can do on a daily basis. It doesn't require some big political changes that some big political, uh, how shall I say, or, or social or economic uh, interventions. It is something that each citizen uh, in their own capacity can practice on a daily basis. And through that practice, they can slowly move away, starting with protests through movement building and all the way to building of these parallel institutions. And so my, my work uh, in the last 20 years was helping activists uh, as, a, uh, as a trainer, as a consultant, as a, somebody who was uh, advising uh, groups, was trying to, to, to help them kind of uh, create the, the, the necessary conditions and the ne necessary number of people who can actually start building that uh, process. And then uh, currently in, 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 in my work with, uh, with uh, ICNC, which brings me to the, the, the last point, is that ICNC has been over the years devoted a lot of resources in capturing the lessons of movements and especially doing research and supporting research, which kind of uh, showcases the efficiency or uh, effectiveness actually but also the efficiency the effectiveness of uh, of nonviolent action and civil resistance and and what we are trying to do now is to build on that research and to uh, move more towards applied research and uh, showcasing the best practices of movements that are captured uh, in their stories, in their testimonies, and to kind of tackle different aspects of movement building, civil resistance, and uh, and uh, uh, nonviolent action. Because we believe that with the with the data that we have, and with the case studies that 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 we have, and with like all the research that has been done by many scholars, that uh, the case. Uh, is closed and that nonviolent action and civil resistance is the most effective way of doing politics. And now we need to just kind of move on towards uh, making it more, more uh, uh, spread and more uh, accepted by the people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, wonderful to have you here today and, and thank you for all your work. Uh, Rosie, please, uh, please join us. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Rosie Davila and I'm very happy to be with all of you. I've had the privilege to work for Pache Bene Campaign Nonviolence as their art and media coordinator. And so Rivera is one of my friends and colleagues. And thank you to everyone who shared today. Um, I got interested in nonviolence 10 years ago when I was 11 years old. So I started to read a lot about different nonviolent activists like Cesar Chavez and Dorothy Day. So I would love for you to take a minute to put anyone who has really inspired you, put their name in the chat. And so as I read about these people, I realized the power of nonviolent movements to create necessary change. And so today I wanna to speak a little bit to the role of youth in nonviolence movements. So one beautiful aspect of these movements is that they can include people of all generations. A phrase that I sometimes hear from older adults is, well, the young people today don't care about nonviolence. But all of us, we know this isn't true. Young people today care deeply about nonviolence and working for peace in our world. We've seen the amazing protests of young people in Iran and all over the globe. And so one of my roles at Pache Bene is co-sponsoring the Youth Collective with Shana Jones. And so we're a group of young activists from across the United States, and we meet monthly to talk about actions and plan actions around a certain justice issue. So we've done mutual aid actions. We've addressed poverty, women's rights, and racism. So if, and, and more. So if you would like to join, please check us out at the Campaign Nonviolence Youth Collective. I'll put that in the chat in a minute. And we would love to have you. 
we see time and time again that with nonviolent movements, we have the most strength when our organizing is intergenerational. With violent struggle, typically only people who are young and healthy can be a part of it, whereas everyone can be a part of a nonviolent struggle. So to the people of Iran who are standing up against their regime, I would say that intergenerational organizing is vital. And remembering that while nonviolence isn't easy, it does have power and it does work. And so we need to stay strong in that. I loved what Rivera said in her talk, nonviolence is a long arc. And so I would like to thank all of you for being here today. It was an honor to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. It's terrific to have uh, have you with us uh, this morning and the, uh, the perspective and the voice uh, of the young. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, invite Michael into the Michael Beer into the conversation. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Beer with Nonviolence International. It is a privilege to be with you here today. Uh, great speakers, and I know there are people all over the world listening. And uh, to create the real globe and society that we want, we really require collective action on a big scale. And today I will introduce what Nonviolence International is trying to do to help promote transnational movements, transnational campaigns, and organizing around the world, whether it's local or up to uh, the global scale because we are going to need everything in order to solve our problems um, and with that i will share a screen and uh, jump right in can you see uh the screen um nonviolence international building a global culture of nonviolence building a hope in troubled times founded by mubarak awad in 1989 a palestinian leader and we've been promoting nonviolence around the world at that time. Um, one of the things we do is we sponsor all kinds of nonviolent groups uh, and raise, help them raise money and provide support for them. And here are some of them, Center for Jewish Nonviolence, US Boats to Gaza, Holy Land Trust, Isaiah Project, We Are Not Numbers, Control Arms. Typically, the, these are in three buckets. One is we support a lot of Palestinian justice work and if you want to help out in the Palestinian area, please contact us because we have lots of groups that we work with. They're doing phenomenal work. We also are very much uh, part of and helped uh, found the humanitarian disarmament movement, which is started in 1995 with the landmine treaty. But this is a effort on the part of small states and civil society around the world to uh, disarm because we can't just rely on on the Soviet Union or Russia and the United States to have nice treaties about big weaponries. We really need the whole world uh, involved, and we know that the imperial powers uh, are not really likely to put in the kind of uh, disarmament treaties that we really need. So we started a uh, a movement around the world to start banning weapon systems with landmines, cluster munitions. Now we have the Treaty for the Prohibition for Nuclear Weapons and others. So please join us in, in, in supporting groups that are working towards humanitarian disarmament. And then we also support a training and nonviolent action groups around the world. Uh, one of the things we do is we collect nonviolent tactics. We've collected 350 in a database. You can find that at tactics.nonviolenceinternational.net. I'll put that in the chat. And we've uh, continued to collect uh, tactics from all over the world. And the idea here is that nonviolence is enormously powerful and uh, creative. We really now in the contemporary era have nonviolent resistance going on in all of the 200 some polities of the world, countries of the world on almost a daily basis. I mean, the scale of nonviolent action now is just absolutely amazing. And we're trying to capture a little bit of it in a database and we would welcome your help to try to add to this database if you know of new nonviolent tactics that we should be should be adding or new examples that we can add to the database, please uh, let us know. Um, we have, uh, I've written a book about nonviolent tactics called Civil Resistance Tactics in the 21st Century. 
Yvonne's group, the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, has published this book in English, Farsi, and Spanish. And what we've done here is we've really tried to categorize the enormous universe of nonviolent action. Uh, and we've done so looking at how does nonviolent action and tactics really work. And the way nonviolent tactics really work are through controlling resources. On the orange, you can see on the left-hand side, there are three things you can do to control resources. You can, you can do things by saying things or communicating. You can not do things, or you can create and do things. And these are the three ways that nonviolent movements uh, uh, make things happen through controlling resources. And then in the uh, other uh, axis, you can see the nature of tactic inducements. Uh, you can either con confront or you can be constructive in your nonviolent action. Uh, we heard earlier Yvonne talking about parallel institutions, which would be on the constructive side. We've saw a lot of uh, examples uh, from nonviolent news of uh, people expressing themselves in very creative ways. So I think it's a helpful to understand that there is just an enormous uh, ar array of nonviolent action that is being carried out. And we're trying to capture some of that in this in this book that I've written and in this uh, categorization of non nonviolent action. Art is resistance. Here are some, of, some brief examples. Uh, certainly the arts are immensely creative and important. Um, surveillance is a wonderful technique in which, of course, the corporations and the government surveil us from the top down. But sue is the French word for under. We uh, surveil the police. We surveil the authorities and we reveal their misdeeds. Um, Castle Rosa is a started in Chile in 1971 and is a way of, of banging on pots and pans to get your your message across. Digital games and digital resistance. There's all kinds of wonderful things being done in that regard. Murals is another thing. We see beautiful murals on the on the walls of Palestine uh, and Israel. Uh, that the Israelis have put up to partition and, and take over Palestine. Die-ins are something that we uh, see all over the world. This was a die-in here, is uh, uh, U.S. Jews supporting uh, human rights for, for uh, Gazans and Lebanon. And flash mobs, these are uh, ways of organizing people very quickly. Uh, this happens to be in the downtown uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, uh, people calling for uh, independence and freedom there. Um, so in addition to all these tactics that we do at Nonviolence International, we are really focused right now on campaigns and would welcome you to join us. Uh, one of these campaigns is Nonviolent Resistance to Annexations. It will reduce the utility of war and militarism. There are th four major annexations in the world today, and we really need to draw a line and say no to a military occupation and annexation of any neighboring territory. And there are now these major ones that the UN has uh, declared to be really violations of international law. And if the world can say no to annexations and really prevent countries from doing this, we will do a lot to reduce the causes of militarism and war, because this is the the cause of much militarism and war. So we are very much uh, working with the Palestinians and their allies to resist the annexations of East Jerusalem and the Golan. We are uh, working strongly with the Sahrawis uh, to uh, support their efforts to end their occupation and annexation by Morocco. A lot of people don't know about this terrible conflict. We just helped send in a team of international uh, people to stop the rape and torture of the Kaya sisters in Bujdur, Western Sahara, and succeeded in, in interrupting this um, horrific uh, abuse of the Kaya family. But this abuse, of course, is systemic uh, on the whole Sahrawi people, and we need to end this uh, annexation uh, today. And we're also supporting uh, Ukrainians and Russians in the efforts to stop the annexation of Ukrainian territories helping set up clandestine underground schools in occupied Ukraine 
and doing uh, uh, what we can to support the hundreds of thousands of now Russian young men who are fleeing Russia uh, to places like Kazakhstan, Turkey, uh, Kyrgyz, and others uh, to uh, to stop uh, support or any involvement in the Russian war and occupation of Ukraine. So. Uh, please join us if you want to. These are uh, very important kind of campaigns that are connected to each other that we need to, to support because uh, terrible suffering is going on. Uh, this is Mubarak Awadah, founder, who is doing a lot of Palestinian resistance work. This is a photograph of uh, some of the internationals that came in to interrupt the siege of the Chaya sisters uh, in Western Sahara. Uh, please uh, join us at nonviolenceinternational.net uh, and learn more about us, get involved. Uh, there's lots of ways to get involved to help transnational movements. We've for many, many decades supported the Iranian nonviolent movement. And you can find us a huge Facebook uh, community on uh, uh, in of Iranians and Farsi speakers uh, called Bikoshunat, which means nonviolence in, in Farsi. And you can go there to uh, join the uh, Iranian uh, uh, community that's uh, working for resistance in, in Iran. Let me just finally say, with regards to Iran and with regards to a lot of these other movements, that there is a tremendous amount of nonviolent history that you all can draw upon from your own communities and cultures. In the Iran's case, not, uh, in modern history, you can go back to 1890, 1891 with the tobacco revolution. You can look point to 1905 where the non uh, uh, movement came up to do a major revolution in Iran in 1905. You have lots and lots of history in Iran of nonviolent resistance that you can draw upon uh, and, and use today, as well as, of course, learning from what people are doing around the world. We also see in many other countries, every other country, there are histories of nonviolent struggle and resistance that have not been documented. Please, in every country, we need histories of nonviolent struggle for every single country and community that we can pass on to the next generation to say, look, nonviolent struggle is part of our heritage. It's part of what's brought us here today. And it's part of what will liberate our country as well as help us in the transnational efforts of climate change and, and other challenges to take on militarism in war uh, and to support human rights, that we have these traditions within our own uh, communities to succeed. Please join us at Nonviolence International to build a global movement for nonviolence. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you back um, as we wrap up today's uh, program. And certainly the, the, the primary message to our audience is that nonviolence is happening all over the world. And more importantly, it works. I mean, it, we, we have tried to share with, with everybody lots and lots and lots of examples of where nonviolence is being practiced, where it's being used and to successful outcomes. So uh, Michael Nagler, uh, please jump in and share your thoughts on, on today and the last uh, week and a half. Uh, it was uh, so heartwarming and inspiring for me to hear from everyone. Uh, I knew every one of you beforehand. I feel I know you better now. <laughs> and uh, uh, this has been so rich, this whole uh, program. If there were, you know, this is our own local example of the fact that nonviolence is happening everywhere. And uh, I know. Some of you feel, I probably feel that at the end of this week, we don't want this to just <laughs> go go away. So I have put a link now in the chat box to a course that Meta Center will be offering on 30 days of nonviolence. And uh, we're going to have to close registration soon because it's a, we're human. <laughs> Only so much we can handle. So if you'd like to join us, uh, in that course, I recommend that you, you register shortly. Uh, gosh, you know, heart full of gratitude and inspiration uh, for all that you've all shared. Thank you so, so much. And looks like, Tom, we have time for maybe one last word and we're, we're off for the day. <laughs> 
Jim, any uh, any questions for our uh, our panel or thoughts on uh, on today's program? I have been completely inspired uh, by the program today, and uh, particularly Rivera at the beginning, just with a kind of a global update of everything that's going on out there. I, I, it's like so much in the news is on violence, war, scandal, corruption, you know, at high levels. And uh, just to have the refreshing uh, reporting of each of you uh, and to really know that there's a lot of work going on at many levels in many parts of the world simultaneously that are carrying forward and refining uh, the techniques of nonviolence. I think uh, that was just very heartful for me. So I'm uh, more uh, inspired uh, certainly than I was 10 days ago about uh, what's really possible in this world, because I think sometimes we forget. And uh, that's one reason why we have humanity rising day in and day out which is around solutions, it's around inspiration, it's around what we can do. Um, you know, I think uh, Banafshe said something important that even without hope, even if you're beyond hope, you can still stake, take a stand on what's ethical, what's moral. And I think that's the cornerstone of any kind of nonviolent action and resistance in the world. In the end, it's the moral thing to do. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank you and uh, 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 and thank you, Rivera, for that uh, uh, global update. We we should do more of it as humanity rising uh, continues uh, because it was so inspiring. All of you were just very very inspiring. Uh, we'd love to have you back uh, episodically just to give uh, little updates if there's something particularly burning and uh, successful and inspiring that you want to report in on. Um, but Tom, why don't you give us a sense about tomorrow and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. And uh, once again, thank you all for being with us today. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're focusing on nonviolence, our bridge to the future. And, you know, we, we've talked about um, the third harmony and in, in the story uh, the new story of humanity. But the reality is, uh, you know, the, in the film and certainly over the last week and a half, what we focused on is not the new story of humanity, but it's it's the old story. It's our original story that as a species, we're hired hardwired for collaboration and cooperation. And so, tomorrow we're gonna we're gonna focus on um, the bridge to the future and how nonviolence and returning to our, our original state. Um, will get us to the future state that we all hunger for. And uh, like today, we've got a, another extraordinary group of panelists who will, will help us understand uh, all the work that's been happening in the world and how, to, how we get there. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, Tom, somebody asked if you could talk about the link for the screening on Saturday of the whole film. Yeah, we'll we'll be working with uh, with Jim and the Humanity Rising staff to get an art card up um, and a link for for the screening on Saturday of uh, of the Third Harmony, and uh, we'll we'll the intention is we'll be broadcasting at the same time on Saturday that we do every week, or every day of the week. Cool. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. This has been uh, good for my soul today. Uh, and uh, so I deeply uh, express my thanks on behalf of everyone. Uh, and that'll bring us uh, to a close, everyone. You're all welcome to the after session chat group. You'll see the link uh, in the chat that Stan uh, has put in. And we'll see you then tomorrow for day number nine of a 10 day program on uh, nonviolence in our world. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.